Chapter Nineteen of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Nineteen The Third Attack. Now that this treasure which had so long been the object of the abbey's meditations, could ensure the future happiness of him whom Faria really loved as a son, it had doubled its value in his eyes, and every day he expatiated on the amount, explaining to Dantes all the good which, with thirteen or fourteen millions of francs, a man could do in these days to his friends. And then Dantes' countenance became gloomy, for the oath of vengeance he had taken, recurred to his memory, and he reflected how much ill, in these times, a man with thirteen or fourteen million could do to his enemies. The abbey did not know the island of Monte Cristo, but Dantes knew it, and had often passed it, situated twenty-five miles from Pianosa, between Corsica and the island of Elba, and had once touched there. This island was, always had been, and still is, completely deserted. It is a rock of almost conical form, which looks as though it had been thrust up by volcanic force from the depth to the surface of the ocean. Dantes drew a plan of the island for Faria, and Faria gave Dantes advice as to the means he should employ to recover the treasure. But Dantes was far from being as enthusiastic in confidence as the old man. It was past the question now that Faria was not a lunatic, and the way in which he had achieved the discovery which had given rise to the suspicion of his madness, increased Edmond's admiration of him. But at the same time Dantes could not believe that the deposit, supposing it had ever existed, still existed. And though he considered the treasure as by no means chimerical, he yet believed it was no longer there. However, as if fate resolved on depriving the prisoners of their last chance, and making them understand that they were condemned to perpetual imprisonment, a new misfortune befell them. The gallery on the seaside, which had long been in ruins, was rebuilt. They had repaired it completely, and stopped up with vast masses of stone the whole Dantes had partly filled in. But for this precaution, which, it will be remembered, the abbe had made to Edmond, the misfortune would have been still greater, for their attempt to escape would have been detected, and they would undoubtedly have been separated. Thus a new, a stronger, and more inexorable barrier was interposed to cut off the realization of their hopes. "'You see,' said the young man, with an air of sorrowful resignation to Faria, "'that God deems it right to take from me any claim to merit for what you call my devotion to you. I have promised to remain forever with you, and now I could not break my promise if I would.' The treasure will be no more mine than yours, and neither of us will quit this prison. But my real treasure is not that, my dear friend, which awaits me beneath the sombre rocks of Monte Cristo. It is your presence, our living together five or six hours a day, in spite of our jailers. It is the race of intelligence you have elected from my brain, the languages you have implanted in my memory, and which have taken root there with all their philological ramifications. These different sciences that you have made so easy to me by the depth of the knowledge you possess of them, and the clearness of the principle to which you have reduced them. This is my treasure, my beloved friend, and with this you have made me rich and happy. Believe me, and take comfort. This is better for me than tons of gold and cases of diamonds, even were they not as problematical as the clouds we see in the morning, floating over the sea, which we take for terra firma and which evaporate and vanish as we draw near to them. To have you as long as possible near me, to hear your eloquent speech, which embellishes my mind, strengthens my soul, and makes my whole frame capable of great and terrible things, if I should ever be free, so fills my whole existence, that the despair to which I was just on the point of yielding when I knew you has no longer any hold over me, and this, this is my fortune, not chimerical, but actual. I owe you my real good, my present happiness. 
and all the sovereigns of the earth, even Caesar Borgia himself, could not deprive me of this. Thus, if not actually happy, yet the days these two unfortunates passed together went quickly. Faria, who for so long a time had kept silence as to the treasure, now perpetually talked of it. As he had prophesied would be the case, he remained paralysed in the right arm and the left leg, and had given up all hope of ever enjoying it himself. But he was continually thinking of some means of escape for his young companion, and anticipating the pleasure he would enjoy. For fear the letter might be some day lost or stolen, he compelled Dantes to learn it by heart, and Dantes knew it from the first to the last word. Then he destroyed the second portion, assured that if the first were seized, no one would be able to discover its real meaning. Whole hours sometimes passed, while Faria was given instructions to Dantes, instructions which were to serve him when he was at liberty. Then, once free from the day and hour and moment when he was so, he could have but one only thought, which was, to gain Monte Cristo by some means, and remain there alone, under some pretext, which would arouse no suspicion, and once there, to endeavour to find the wonderful caverns, and search in the appointed spot, the appointed spot, be it remembered, being the farthest angle in the second opening. In the meanwhile the hours passed, if not rapidly, at least tolerably. Faria, as we have said, without having recovered the use of his hand and foot, has regained all the clearness of his understanding, and had gradually, besides the moral instructions we have detailed, taught his youthful companion the patient and sublime duty of a prisoner, who learns to make something from nothing. They were thus perpetually employed. Faria, that he might not see himself grow old, Dantes, for fear of recalling the almost extinct past, which now only floated in his memory like a distant light wandering in the night. So life went on for them, as it does for those who are not victims of misfortune, and whose activities glide along mechanically and tranquilly beneath the eye of providence. But beneath this superficial calm, there were in the heart of the young man, and perhaps in that of the old man, many repressed desires, many stifled sighs, which found vent when Faria was left alone, and when Edmond returned to his cell. One night Edmond woke suddenly, believing that he had heard someone calling him. He opened his eyes upon utter darkness. His name, or rather a plaintive voice, which essayed to pronounce his name, reached him. He sat up in bed, and a cold sweat broke out upon his brow. Undoubtedly the call came from Faria's dungeon. Alas, murmured Edmond, can it be? He moved his bed, drew up the stone, rushed into the passage and reached the opposite extremity. The secret entrance was open. By the light of the wretched and wavering lamp, over which we have spoken, Dantes saw the old man, pale, but yet erect, clinging to the bedstead. His features were writhing with those horrible symptoms which he already knew, and which had so seriously alarmed him when he saw them for the first time. Alas, my dear friend, said Faria in a resigned tone, you understand, do you not, and I need not attempt to explain to you. Edmond uttered a cry of agony, and, quite out of his senses, rushed towards the door, exclaiming, Help! Help! Faria had just sufficient strength to restrain him. Silence, he said, or you are lost. We must now only think of you, my dear friend, and so act as to render your captivity supportable or your flight possible. It would require years to do again what I have done here, and the result would be instantly destroyed if our jailers knew we had communicated with each other. Besides, be assured, my dear Edmond, the dungeon I am about to leave will not long remain empty. Some other unfortunate being will soon take my place, and to him you will appear like an angel of salvation. Perhaps he will be young, strong, and enduring, like yourself, and will aid you in your escape, while I have been but a hindrance. You will no longer have half a dead body tied to you as a drag to all your movements. At length Providence has done something for you. He restores to you more than he takes away, and it was time I should die. Edmond could only clasp his hands and exclaim, Oh, my friend, my friend, speak not thus! 
and then resuming all his presence of mind, which had for a moment staggered under this blow, and his strength, which had failed at the words of the old man, he said, "'Oh, I have saved you once, and I will save you a second time,' and raising the foot of the bed, he drew out the phial, still a third filled with a red liquor. "'See!' he exclaimed, "'there remains still some of the magic draught. Quick! Quick! Tell me what I must do this time. Are there any fresh instructions?' speak my friend i listen there is not a hope replied faria shaking his head but no matter god wills it that man whom he has created and in whose heart he has so profoundly rooted the love of life should do all in his power to preserve that existence which however painful it may be is yet always so dear oh yes yes exclaimed dantes and i tell you that i will save you yet well then try the cold gains upon me i feel the blood flowing towards my brain these horrible chills which make my teeth chatter and seem to dislocate my bones begin to pervade my whole frame in five minutes the malady will reach its height and in a quarter of an hour there will be nothing left of me but a corpse oh exclaimed dantes his heart wrung with anguish do as you did before only do not wait so long all the springs of life are now exhausted in me, and death. He continued, looking at his paralysed arm and leg, has but half its work to do. If, after having made me swallow twelve drops instead of ten, you see that I do not recover, then pour the rest down my throat. Now lift me on my bed, for I cannot longer support myself. Edmond took the old man in his arms and laid him on the bed. And now, my dear friend, said faria sole consolation of my wretched existence you whom heaven gave me somewhat late but still gave me a priceless gift and for which i am most grateful at the moment of separating from you for ever i wish you all the happiness and all the prosperity you so well deserve my son i bless thee the young man cast himself on his knees leaning his head against the old man's bed Listen now to what I say in this my dying moment. The treasure of the Spadas exists. God grants me the boon of a vision unrestricted by time or space. I see it in the depth of the inner cavern. My eyes pierce the inmost recesses of the earth and are dazzled at the sight of so much riches. If you do escape, remember that the poor abbe, whom all the world called mad, was not so. Hasten to Monte Cristo. Avail yourself of the fortune, for you have indeed suffered long enough. A violent convulsion attacked the old man. Dantes raised his head and saw Faria's eyes injected with blood. It seemed as if a flow of blood had ascended from the chest to the head. Adieu! Adieu! murmured the old man, clasping Edmond's hand convulsively. Adieu! Oh, no! No, not yet! he cried. Do not forsake me! Oh, secure him! Help! 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 Hush! Hush! murmured the dying man, that they may not separate us if you save me. You are right. Oh, yes, yes. Be assured I shall save you. Besides, although you suffer much, you do not seem to be in such agony as you were before. Do not mistake. I suffer less because there is in me less strength to endure. At your age we have faith in life. It is the privilege of youth to believe and hope. But all men see death more clearly. Oh, tis here, tis here, tis over. My sight is gone. My senses fail. Your hand, Dantes, adieu, adieu. And raising himself by a final effort, in which he summoned all his faculties, he said, Monte Cristo, forget not, Monte Cristo. And he fell back on the bed. The crisis was terrible, and a rigid form with twisted limbs, swollen eyelids, and lips flecked with bloody foam, lay on the bed of torture in place of the intellectual being who so lately rested there. Dantes took the lamp, placed it on a projecting stone above the bed whence his tremulous light fell with strange and fantastic ray on the disordered countenance and motionless, stiffened body. 
with steady gaze he awaited confidently the moment for administering the restorative. When he believed that the right moment had arrived, he took the knife, pried open the teeth, which offered less resistance than before, counted one after the other twelve drops, and watched. The file contained perhaps twice as much more. He awaited ten minutes, a quarter of an hour, half an hour. No change took place. Trembling, his hair erect, his brow bathed with perspiration, he counted the seconds by the beating of his heart. Then he thought it was time to make the last trial, and put the file to the purple lips of Faria, and without having occasion to force open his jaws, which had remained extended, pour the whole of the liquid down his throat. The draught produced a galvanic effort. A violent trembling pervaded the old man's limbs. His eyes opened until it was fearful to gaze upon them. He heaved a sigh, which resembled a shriek, and then his convulsed body returned gradually to its former immobility, the eyes remaining open. Half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half elapsed, and during this period of anguish Edmond leaned over his friend. His hand applied to his heart, and felt the body gradually grow cold, and the heart's pulsation become more and more deep and dull, until at length it stopped. The last movement of the heart ceased. The face became livid, the eyes remained open, but the eyeballs were glazed. It was six o'clock in the morning. The dawn was just breaking, and its feeble ray came into the dungeon, and paled the ineffectual light of the lamp. Strange shadows passed over the countenance of the dead man, and at times gave it the appearance of life. While the struggle between day and night lasted, Dante still doubted, but as soon as the daylight gained the pre-eminence, he saw that he was alone with the corpse. Then an invisible and extreme terror seized upon him, and he dared not again press the hand that hung out of bed. He dared no longer to gaze on those fixed and vacant eyes, which he tried many times to close, but in vain. They opened again as soon as shut. He extinguished the lamp, carefully concealed it, and then went away closing as well as he could the entrance to the secret passage by the large stone as he descended. It was time, for the jailer was coming. On this occasion he began his rounds at Dante's cell, and on leaving him he went on to Faria's dungeon, taking thither breakfast and some linen. Nothing betokened that the man knew anything of what had occurred. He went on his way. Dante's was then seized with an indescribable desire, to know what was going on in the dungeon of his unfortunate friend. He therefore returned by the subterraneous gallery, and arrived in time to hear the exclamations of the turnkey, who called out for help. Other turnkeys came, and then was heard the regular tramp of soldiers. Last of all came the governor. Edmond heard the creaking of the bed as they moved the corpse, heard the voice of the governor who asked them to throw water on the dead man's face, and seeing that, in spite of this application, the prisoner did not recover, they sent for the doctor. The governor then went out, and words of pity fell on Dante's listening ears, mingled with brutal laughter. "'Well, well,' said one, "'the madman has gone to look after his treasure. Good journey to him.' "'With all his millions he will not have enough to pay for his shroud,' said another. "'Oh,' added a third voice, the shrouds of the Chateau d'If are not dear. Perhaps, said one of the previous speakers, as he was a churchman, they may go to some expense in his behalf. They may give him the honours of the sack. Edmond did not lose a word, but comprehended very little of what was said. The voices soon ceased, and it seemed to him as if every one had left the cell. Still he dared not enter, as they might have left some turnkey to watch the dead. He remained, therefore, mute and motionless, hardly venturing to breathe. At the end of an hour he heard a faint noise, which increased. It was the governor who returned, followed by the doctor and other attendants. There was a moment's silence. It was evident that the doctor was examining the dead body. The inquiries soon commenced. The doctor analysed the symptoms of the malady to which the prisoner had succumbed, 
and declared that he was dead. Questions and answers followed in a nonchalant manner that made Dantes indignant, for he felt that all the world should have had for the poor abbe a love and respect equal to his own. "'I am very sorry for what you tell me,' said the governor, replying to the assurance of the doctor, "'that old man is really dead, for he was a quiet, inoffensive prisoner, happy in his folly, and required no watching.' "'Ah,' uh, added the turnkey, "'there was no occasion for watching him. "'He would have stayed there fifty years, "'I'll answer for it, without any attempt to escape.' "'Still,' said the governor, "'I believe it will be a requisite, "'notwithstanding your certainty, "'and not that I doubt your science, "'but in discharge for my official duty, "'that we should be perfectly assured "'that the prisoner is dead.' "'There was a moment of complete silence, "'during which Dantes, still listening, knew that the doctor was examining the corpse a second time. "'You may make your mind easy,' said the doctor. "'He is dead. I will answer for that.' "'You know, sir,' said the governor, persisting, "'that we are not content in such cases as this with a simple examination. "'In spite of all appearances, be so kind, therefore, "'as to finish your duty by fulfilling the formalities described by law.' "'Let the irons be heated,' said the doctor. "'but really it is a useless precaution.' "'This order to heat the irons made Dantes shudder. "'He heard hasty steps, the creaking of a door, "'people going and coming, "'and some minutes afterwards a turnkey entered, saying, "'Here is the brazier, lighted.' "'There was a moment's silence, "'and then was heard the crackling of burning flesh, "'over which the peculiar and nauseous smell "'penetrated even behind the wall "'where Dantes was listening in horror.' The perspiration poured forth upon the young man's brow, and he felt as if he should faint. "'You see, sir, he is really dead,' said the doctor. "'This burn in the heel is decisive. The poor fool is cured of his folly, and delivered from his captivity.' "'Wasn't his name Faria?' inquired one of the officers who accompanied the governor. "'Yes, sir, and, as he said, it was an ancient name.' He was too very learned, and rational enough on all points which did not relate to his treasure, but on that, indeed, he was intractable. "'It is the sort of malady which we call monomania,' said the doctor. "'You had never anything to complain of?' said the governor to the jailer who had charge of the abbey. "'Never, sir,' replied the jailer. "'Never. On the contrary, he sometimes amused me very much by telling me stories. One day, too, when my wife was ill, he gave me a prescription which cured her. Ah, ah, said the doctor, I did not know that I had a rival. But I hope, Governor, that you will show him all proper respect. Yes, yes, make your mind easy. He shall be decently interred in the newest sack we can find. Will that satisfy you? Must this last formality take place in your presence, sir? inquired the turnkey. Certainly. "'But make haste. I cannot stay here all day.' Other footsteps, going and coming, were now heard, and a moment afterwards the noise of rustling canvas reached Dante's ears. The bed creaked, and the heavy footfall of a man who lifts a weight sounded on the floor. Then the bed again creaked under the weight deposited upon it. "'This evening,' said the governor. "'Will there be a mass?' asked one of the attendants. "'That is impossible,' replied the governor. "'The chaplain of the chateau came to me yesterday "'to beg for a leave of absence "'in order to take a trip to Hieres for a week. "'I told him I would attend to the prisoners in his absence. "'If the poor abbe had not been in such a hurry, "'he might have had his requiem.' "'Po, po,' said the doctor, "'with the impiety usual in persons of his profession. "'He is a churchman. "'God will respect his profession.' and not give the devil the wicked delight of sending him a priest. A shout of laughter followed this brutal jest. Meanwhile the operation of putting the body in the sack was going on. "'This evening,' said the governor, when the task was ended. "'At what hour?' inquired a turnkey. "'Why, about ten or eleven o'clock. "'Shall we watch the corpse? "'Or what use would it be? "'Shut the dungeon as if he were alive. "'That is all.' Then the steps retreated, and the voices died away in the distance. The noise of the door, 
with its creaking hinges and bolts ceased, and a silence more sombre than that of solitude ensued, the silence of death, which was all pervasive, and struck its icy chill to the very soul of Dantes. Then he raised the flagstone cautiously with his head, and looked carefully around the chamber. It was empty, and Dantes emerged from the tunnel. End of chapter 19 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway, the 28th of February, 2012. Chapter 20 of The Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 20 The Cemetery of Chateau d'If. On the bed, at full length, and faintly illuminated by the pale light that came from the window, lay a sack of canvas, and under its rude folds was stretched a long and stiffened form. It was Faria's last winding sheet, a winding sheet which, as the turnkey said, cost so little. Everything was in readiness. A barrier had been placed between Dantes and his old friend. No longer could Edmond look into those wide open eyes which had seemed to be penetrating the mysteries of death. No longer could he clasp the hand which had done so much to make his existence blessed. Faria, the beneficent and cheerful companion, with whom he was accustomed to live so intimately, no longer breathed. He seated himself on the edge of that terrible bed, and fell into melancholy and gloomy reverie. Alone. He was alone again, again condemned to silence again face to face with nothingness, alone, never again to see the face, never again to hear the voice of the only human being who united him to earth. Was not Faria's fate the better, after all, to solve the problem of life at its source, even at the risk of horrible suffering? The idea of suicide, which his friend had driven away and kept away by his cheerful presence, now hovered like a phantom over the abbey's dead body. "'If I could die,' he said, "'I should go where he goes, and should assuredly find him again. But how to die? It is very easy.' He went on with a smile. "'I will remain here, rush on the first person that opens the door, strangle him, and then they will guillotine me.' But excessive grief is like a storm at sea, where the frail bark, is tossed from the depth to the top of the wave. Dantes recoiled from the idea of so infamous a death, and passed suddenly from despair to an ardent desire for life and liberty. Die? Oh, no! he exclaimed. Not die now, after having lived and suffered so long and so much. Die? Yes, had I died years ago but now to die would be, indeed, to give way to the sarcasm of destiny. No, I want to live. I shall struggle to the very last. I will yet win back the happiness of which I have been deprived. Before I die, I must not forget that I have my executioners to punish, and perhaps too, who knows, some friends to reward. Yet they will forget me here, and I shall die in my dungeon like Faria. As he said this, he became silent and gazed straight before him, like one overwhelmed with a strange and amazing thought. Suddenly he arose, lifted his hand to his brow as if his brain were giddy, paced twice or thrice round the dungeon, and then paused abruptly by the bed. "'Just God!' he muttered. "'Whence comes this thought? Is it from thee? Since none but the dead pass freely from this dungeon,' Let me take the place of the dead. Without giving himself time to reconsider his decision, and, indeed, that he might not allow his thoughts to be distracted from his desperate resolution, he bent over the appalling shroud, opened it with a knife which Faria had made, drew the corpse from the sack, and bore it along the tunnel to his own chamber, laid it on his couch, tied around its head the rag he wore at night around his own, covered it with his counterpane, once again kissed the ice-cold brow, and tried vainly to close the resisting eyes, 
which glared horribly, turned the head towards the wall, so that the jailer might, when he brought the evening meal, believe that he was asleep, as was his frequent custom, entered the tunnel again, drew the bed against the wall, returned to the other cell, took from the hiding-place the needle and thread flung off his rags, that they may feel only naked flesh beneath the coarse canvas, and getting inside the sack, placed himself in the posture in which the dead body had been laid, and sewed up the mouth of the sack from inside. He would have been discovered by the beating of his heart, if by any mischance the jailers had entered at that moment. Dantes might have waited until the evening visit was over, but he was afraid that the governor would change his mind, and order the dead body to be removed earlier. In that case, his last hope would have been destroyed. Now his plans were fully made, and this is what he intended to do. If while he was being carried out, the gravediggers should discover that they were bearing alive instead of a dead body, Dantes did not intend to give them time to recognize him, but with a sudden cut of the knife, he meant to open the sack from top to bottom and, profiting by their alarm, escape. If they tried to catch him, he would use his knife to better purpose. If they took him to the cemetery and laid him in a grave, he would allow himself to be covered with earth, and then, as it was night, the gravediggers could scarcely have turned their backs, before he would have worked his way through the yielding soil and escaped. He hoped that the weight of the earth would not be so great that he could not overcome it. If he was detected in this, and the earth proved too heavy, he would be stifled, and then, so much the better, all would be over. Dantes had not eaten since the preceding evening, but he had not thought of hunger, nor did he think of it now. His situation was too precautious to allow him even time to reflect on any thought but one. The first risk that Dantes ran was that the jailer, when he brought him his supper at seven o'clock, might perceive the change that had been made. Fortunately, twenty times at least, from misanthropy or fatigue, Dantes had received his jailer in bed, and then the man placed his bread and soup on the table, and went away without saying a word. This time the jailer might not be as silent as usual, but speak to Dantes, and seeing that he received no reply, go to the bed, and thus discover all. When seven o'clock came, Dantes' agony really began. His hand placed upon his heart was unable to redress its throbbings, while with the other he wiped the perspiration from his temples. From time to time chills ran through his whole body, and clutched his heart in a grasp of ice. Then he thought he was going to die. Yet the hours passed on without any unusual disturbance, and Dantes knew that he had escaped the first peril. It was a good augury. At length, about the hour the governor had appointed, footsteps were heard on the stairs. Edmond felt that the moment had arrived, summoned up all his courage, held his breath, and would have been happy if at the same time he could have repressed the throbbing of his veins. The footsteps, they were double, paused at the door, and Dantes guessed that the two grave-diggers had come to seek him. This idea was soon converted into certainty, when he heard a noise they made in putting down the hand-beer. The door opened, and a dim light reached Dantes' eyes through the coarse sack that covered him. He saw two shadows approach his bed, a third remaining at the door with the torch in its hand. The two men, approaching at the ends of the bed, took the sack by its extremities. "'He's heavy, though, for an old and thin man,' said one as he raised the head. "'They say every year adds half a pound to the weight of the bones,' said another, lifting the feet. "'Have you tied the knot?' inquired the first speaker. "'What will be the use of carrying so much more weight?' was the reply. "'I can do that when we get there.' "'Yes, you're right.' replied the companion. "'What's the knot for?' thought Dantes. They deposited the supposed corpse on the bier. Edmond stiffened himself in order to play the part of a dead man, and then the party, lighted by the man with the torch, who went first, ascended the stairs. Suddenly he felt the fresh and sharp night air, and Dantes knew that the mistral was blowing, it was a sensation in which pleasure and pain were strangely mingled. The bearers went on for twenty paces, then stopped, putting the bear down on the ground. One of them went away, 
and Dantes heard his shoes striking on the pavement. "'Where am I?' he asked himself. "'Really, he's by no means a light load,' said the other bearer, sitting on the edge of the hand-barrow. Dante's first impulse was to escape, but fortunately he did not attempt it. "'Give us a light,' said the other bearer, "'or I shall never find what I am looking for.' The man with the torch complied, although not asked in the most polite terms. "'What can he be looking for?' thought Edmond. "'The spade, perhaps?' An exclamation of satisfaction indicated that the gravedigger had found the object of his search. "'Here it is at last,' he said. "'Not without some trouble, though.' "'Yes,' was the answer. "'But it has lost nothing by waiting.' As he said this, the man came towards Edmond, who heard a heavy metallic substance lay down beside him, and at the same moment a cord was fastened round his feet, with sudden and painful violence. "'Well, have you tied a knot?' inquired the grave-digger, who was looking on. "'Yeah, and pretty tight, too, I can tell you,' was the answer. "'Move on, then.' And the bear was lifted once more, and they proceeded. They advanced fifty paces farther, and then stopped to open a door, then went forward again. The noise of the waves dashing against the rocks on which the chateau is built reached Dante's air distinctly as they went forward. "'Bad weather,' observed one of the bearers, not a pleasant night for a dip in the sea. Why, yes, the abbey runs a chance of being wet, said the other, and then there was a burst of brutal laughter. Dantes did not comprehend the jest, but his hair stood erect on his head. Well, here we are at last, said one of them. A little farther, a little farther, said the other. You know very well the last was stopped on his way, dashed on the rocks, and the governor told us next day that we were careless fellows. They ascended five or six more steps, and then Dantes felt that they took him, one by the head and the other by the heels, and swung him to and fro. One, said the grave diggers. Two, three, and at the same instant Dantes felt himself flung into the air like a wounded bird, falling, falling, with a rapidity that made his blood curdle. Although drawn towards by the heavy weight which hastened his rapid descent, it seemed to him as if the fall lasted for a century. At last, with a horrible splash, he darted like an arrow into the ice-cold water, and as he did so he uttered a shrill cry, stifled in a moment by his immersion beneath the waves. Dantes had been flung into the sea, and was dragged into its depth by a thirty-six-pound shot tied to his feet. The sea is the cemetery of the Chateau d'If. End of chapter 20 Recording by Christine G. in Oslo, Norway The 28th of February, 2012Chapter 21 of The Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Von Ullman. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 21. The Island of Tiboulin. Dantes, although stunned and almost suffocated, had sufficient presence of mind to hold his breath and as his right hand, prepared as he was for every chance, held his knife open, he rapidly ripped up the sack, extricated his arm, and then his body, but in spite of all his efforts to free himself from the shot, he still felt it dragging him down still lower. He then bent his body, and by a desperate effort severed the cord that bound his legs, at the moment when it seemed as if he were actually strangled. With a mighty leap he rose to the surface of the sea, while the shot dragged down to the depths the sack that had so nearly become his shroud. Dantes waited only to get his breath, and then dived, in order to avoid being seen. When he rose a second time, he was fifty paces from where he had first sunk. He saw overhead a black and tempestuous sky, across which the wind was driving clouds that occasionally suffered a twinkling star to appear. Before him was the vast expanse of water, somber and terrible, whose waves foamed and roared, as if before the approach of a storm. Behind him, blacker than the sea, blacker than the sky, rose phantom-like the vast stone structure, whose projecting crags seemed like arms extended to seize their prey. 
and on the highest rock was a torch lighting two figures. He fancied that these two forms were looking at the sea. Doubtless these strange grave-diggers had heard his cry. Dantes dived again and remained a long time beneath the water. This was an easy feat to him, for he usually attracted a crowd of spectators in the bay before the lighthouse at Marseilles when he swam there, and was unanimously declared to be the best swimmer in the port. When he came up again, the light had disappeared. He must now get his bearings. Ratonneau and Pochmigu are the nearest islands of all those that surround the Chateau d'If, but Ratonneau and Pomigu are inhabited, as is also the islet of Dome. Tibulin and Le Mer were therefore the safest of Dante's venture. The islands of Tibulin and Le Mer are a league from the Chateau d'If. Dante is nevertheless determined to make for them, but how could he find his way in the darkness of the night? At this moment he saw the light of Flanier, gleaning in front of him like a star. By leaving this light on the right, he kept the island of Tibulin a little on the left. By turning to the left, therefore, he would find it. But as we have said, it was at least a league from the Chateau d'If to this island. Often, in prison, Fariad said to him, when he saw him idle and inactive, Dante, you must not give way to this listlessness. You'll be drowned if you seek to escape, and your strength has not been properly exercised and prepared for exertion. These words rang in Dante's ears, even beneath the waves. If he hastened to cleave his way through them to see if he had not lost his strength, he found with pleasure that his captivity had taken away nothing of his power, and that he was still master of that element on whose bosom he had so often sported as a boy. Fear, that relentless pursuer, clogged Dante's efforts. He listened for any sound that might be audible, and every time that he rose to the top of a wave he scanned the horizon, and strove to penetrate the darkness. He fancied that every wave behind him was a pursuing boat, and he redoubled his exertions, increasing rapidly his distance from the chateau, but exhausting his strength. He swam on still, and already the terrible chateau had disappeared in the darkness. He could not see it, but he felt its presence. An hour passed, during which Dantes, excited by the feeling of freedom, continued to cleave the waves. "'Let us see,' said he. "'I have swum above an hour, but as the wind is against me, and that has retarded my speed. However, if I am not mistaken, I must be close to Tibulin. But what if I were mistaken?' A shudder passed over him. He sought to tread water in order to rest himself. But the sea was too violent, and he felt that he could not make use of this means of recuperation. Well, said he, I will swim on till I am worn out, or the cramp seizes me, and then I shall sink. And he struck out with the energy of despair. Suddenly the sky seemed to him to become still darker and more dense, and heavy clouds seemed to sweep toward him. At the same time he felt a sharp pain in his knee. He fancied for a moment that he had been shot, and listened for the report, but he heard nothing. Then he put out his hand and encountered an obstacle, and with another stroke knew that he had gained the shore. Before him rose a grotesque mass of rocks that resembled nothing so much as a vast fire petrified at the moment of its most fervent combustion. It was the island of Tibulin. Dante's rose advanced a few steps, and with a fervent prayer of gratitude stretched himself on the granite, which seemed to him softer than down. Then, in spite of the wind and rain, he fell into the deep, sweet sleep of utter exhaustion. At the expiration of an hour, Edmund was awakened by the roar of thunder. The tempest was let loose, and beating the atmosphere with its mighty wings, from time to time a flash of lightning stretched across the heavens like a fiery serpent, lighting up the clouds that rolled on in vast chaotic waves. Dantes had not been deceived. He had reached the first of the two islands, which was, in fact, the Bulin. He knew that it was barren and without shelter. But when the sea became more calm, he resolved to plunge into its waves again, and swim to La Mer, equally arid but larger, and consequently better adapted for concealment. An overhanging rock offered him a temporary shelter, and scarcely had he availed himself of it when the tempest burst forth in all its fury. Edmund felt the trembling of the rock beneath which he lay. The waves, dashing themselves against it, wetted him with their spray. He was safely sheltered, and yet he felt dizzy in the midst of the warring of the elements and the dazzling brightness of the lightning. It seemed to him that the island trembled to its base, and that it would, like a vessel at anchor, break moorings, and bear him off into the centre of the storm. He then recollected that he had not eaten or drunk for four-and-twenty hours. He extended his hands and drank greedily of the rainwater that had lodged in a hollow of the rock. As he rose, a flash of lightning that seemed to rive the remotest heights of heaven illumined the darkness. By its light, between the island of La Mer and Cape Croisel, a quarter of a league distant, Dante saw a fishing-boat driven rapidly like a spectre before the power of winds, waves. A second after he saw it again, 
approaching with frightful rapidity. Dantes cried at the top of his voice to warn them of their danger, but they saw it themselves. Another flash showed him four men clinging to the shattered mast and the rigging, while a fifth clung to the broken rudder. The men he beheld saw him undoubtedly, for their cries were carried to his ears by the wind. Above the splintered mask a sail rent to tatters was waving, and suddenly the rope that still held it gave way, and it disappeared in the darkness of the night like a vast seabird. At the same moment a violent crash was heard, and cries of distress. Dantes, from his rocky perch, saw the shattered vessel, and among the fragments the floating forms of hapless sailors. Then all was dark again. Dantes ran down the rocks at the risk of being himself dashed to pieces. He listened. He groped about, but he heard and saw nothing. The cries had ceased, and the tempest continued to rage. By degrees the wind abated. The vast gray clouds rolled toward the west, and the blue firmament appeared, studded with bright stars. Soon a red streak became visible in the horizon. The waves whitened. A light played over them, and gilded their foaming crests with gold. It was day. Dante stood mute and motionless before this majestic spectacle, as if he now beheld it for the first time. And indeed, since his captivity in the Chateau d'If, he had forgotten that such scenes were ever to be witnessed. He turned towards the fortress, and looked at both sea and land. The gloomy building rose from the bosom of the ocean with imposing majesty, and seemed to dominate the scene. It was about five o'clock. The sea continued to get calmer. In two or three hours, thought Dantes, the turnkey will enter my chamber, find the body of my poor friend, recognize it, seek for me in vain, and give the alarm. Then the tunnel will be discovered, and the men who cast me into the sea, who must have heard the cry I uttered, will be questioned. The boats, filled with armed soldiers, will pursue the wretched fugitive. The cannon will warn everyone to refuse shelter to a man wandering about naked and famished. The police of Marseilles will be on the alert by land, whilst the governor pursues me by sea. I am cold, I am hungry, I have lost even the knife that saved me. Oh, my God, I have suffered enough, surely. Have pity on me, and do for me what I am unable to do for myself. As Dante, his eyes turned in the direction of the Chateau d'If, uttered this prayer, he saw off the further point of the island of Pomegue a small vessel with lanteen sails, skimming the sea like a gull in search of prey. And with a sailor's eye, he knew it to be a Genoese tartan. She was coming out of Marseilles Harbour, and was standing out to sea rapidly, her sharp prow cleaving through the waves. Oh, cried Edmund, to think that in half an hour I could join her, did I not fear being questioned, detected, and conveyed back to Marseilles. What can I do? What story can I invent? Under pretext of trading along the coast, these men, who are in reality smugglers, will prefer selling me to doing a good action. I must wait. But I cannot. I am starving. In a few hours my strength will be utterly exhausted. Besides, perhaps I have not been missed at the fortress. I can pass as one of the sailors wrecked last night. My story will be accepted, for no one left to contradict me. As he spoke, Dante looked toward the spot where the fishing vessel had been wrecked, and started. The red cap of one of the sailors hung to a point of the rock, and some timbers that had formed part of the vessel's keel floated at the foot of the crag. In an instant Dante's plan was formed. He swam to the cap, placed it on his head, seized one of the timbers, and struck out so as to cut across the course of the vessel he was taking. "'I am saved,' murmured he, and this conviction restored his strength. He saw that the vessel, with the wind dead ahead, was tacking between the Chateau d'If and the Tower of Planier. For an instant he feared, lest instead of keeping in shore she should stand out to sea. But he soon saw that she would pass, like most vessels bound for Italy, between the vessels of Jaros and Casselarene. However, the vessel and the swimmer insensibly neared one another, and in one of its tacks the tartan bore down within a quarter of a mile of him. He rose on the waves, making signs of distress, but no one on board saw him, and the vessel stood out on another tack. Dantes would have shouted, but he knew that the wind would drown his voice. It was then he rejoiced at his precaution in taking the timber, for without it he would have been unable, perhaps, to reach the vessel, certainly to return to shore, should he be unsuccessful in attracting attention. Dantes, although almost sure as to what course the vessel would take, had yet watched it anxiously until it tacked and stood toward him. Then he advanced, but before they could meet, the vessel again changed her course. By a violent effort he rose half out of the water, waved his cap, and uttered a loud shout peculiar to sailors. This time he was both seen and heard, and the tartan instantly steered toward him. At the same time he saw they were about to lower the boat. An instant after, the boat, rowed by two men, advanced rapidly toward him. Dantes let go of the timber, which he now thought to be useless, and swam vigorously to meet them. But he had reckoned too much upon his strength 
and then he realized how serviceable the timber had been to him. His arms became stiff, his legs lost their flexibility, and it was almost breathless. He shouted again. The two sailors redoubled their efforts, and one of them cried in Italian, Courage! The word reached his ear as a wave which he no longer had the strength to surmount passed over his head. He rose again to the surface, struggled with the last desperate effort of a drowning man, uttered a third cry, and felt himself sinking, as if the fatal cannon shot were again tied to his feet. The water passed over his head, and the sky turned gray. A convulsive movement again brought him to the surface. He felt himself seized by the hair, and then he saw and heard nothing. He had fainted. When he opened his eyes, Dantes found himself on the deck of the tartan. His first care was to see what course they were taking. They were rapidly leaving the Chateau d'If behind. Dantes was so exhausted that the exclamation of joy he uttered was mistaken for a sigh. As we have said, he was lying on the deck. A sailor was rubbing his limbs with a woolen cloth. Another, whom he recognized as the one who had cried out courage, held a gourd full of rum to his mouth, while the third, an old sailor, at once the pilot and captain, looked on with that egotistical pity men feel for a misfortune that they have escaped yesterday, and which may overtake them to-morrow. A few drops of the rum restored suspended animation, while the friction of his limbs restored their elasticity. "'Who are you?' said the pilot in bad French. "'I am,' replied Dantes in bad Italian, "'a Maltese sailor. We were coming from Syracuse laden with grain. The storm of last night overtook us, at Cape Morgion, and we were wrecked on these rocks.' "'Where do you come from?' "'From these rocks that I had the good luck to cling to, while our captain and the rest of the crew were all lost. I saw your vessel, and fearful of being left to perish on the desolate island, I swam off on a piece of wreckage to try to intercept your course. You have saved my life, and I thank you,' continued Dantes. "'I was lost when one of your sailors caught hold of my hair.' "'It was I,' said a sailor of a frank and manly appearance, "'and it was time, for you were sinking.' "'Yes,' returned Dantes. "'I thank you again.' "'I almost hesitated, though,' replied the sailor. "'You look more like a brigand than an honest man, "'with your beard six inches and your hair a foot long.' "'Dantes recollected that his hair and beard "'had not been cut all the time he was at Chateau d'If. "'Yes,' said he, "'I made a vow to Our Lady of the Grotto "'not to cut my hair or beard for ten years "'if I were saved in a moment of danger. "'But today the vow expires. "'Now what are we to do with you?' said the captain. "'Alas, anything you please. "'My captain is dead. "'I have barely escaped but I am a good sailor. Leave me at the first port you make. I shall be sure to find employment. Do you know the Mediterranean? I have sailed over it since my childhood. You know the best harbors? There are few ports that I could not enter or leave with a bandage over my eyes. I say, Captain, said the sailor who had cried courage to Dantes, if what he says is true, what hinders his staying with us? If he says true, said the captain doubtingly, but in his present condition he will promise anything, and take his chance of keeping it afterwards. "'I will do more than I promise,' said Dantes. "'We shall see,' returned the other, smiling. "'Where are you going?' asked Dantes. "'To Leghorn.' "'Then why, instead of tacking so frequently, do you not sail nearer the wind?' "'Because we should run straight on to the island of Rion. "'You shall pass it by twenty fathoms. "'Take the helm, and let us see what you know.' The young man took the helm, felt to see if the vessel answered the rudder promptly, and seeing that, without being a first-rate sailor, she was yet tolerably obedient. "'To the sheet,' said he. The four seamen who composed the crew obeyed, while the pilot looked on. "'Hall taut.' They obeyed. "'Belay!' This order was also executed, and the vessel passed, as Dante had predicted, twenty fathoms to windward. "'Bravo!' said the captain. "'Bravo!' repeated the sailors and they all looked with astonishment at this man whose eye now disclosed an intelligence and his body a vigor that they had not thought him capable of showing. "'You see,' said Dantes, quitting the helm, "'I shall be of some use to you, at least during the voyage. If you do not want me at Leghorn, you can leave me there, and I will pay you out of the first wages I get for my food and the clothes you lend me.' "'Ah,' said the captain, "'we can agree very well, if you are reasonable.' "'Give me what you give the others, and it will be all right,' returned Dantes. "'That's not fair,' said the seaman who had saved Dantes, "'for you know more than we do.' "'What is that to you, Jacobo?' returned the captain. "'Everyone is free to ask what he pleases.' "'That's true,' replied Jacobo. "'I only make a remark.' "'Well, you would do much better to find him a jacket and a pair of trousers, if you have them.' "'No,' said Jacobo, "'but I have a shirt and a pair of trousers.' "'That is all I want,' interrupted Dantes. Jacobo dived into the hold and soon returned with what Edmund wanted.' 
"'Now, then, do you wish for anything else?' said the patron. "'A piece of bread, another glass of the capital rum I tasted, "'for I have not eaten or drunk for a long time.' "'He had not tasted food for forty hours. "'A piece of bread was brought, and Jacopo offered him the gourd. "'Larboard your helm!' cried the captain to the steersman. "'Dante's glanced that way as he lifted the gourd to his mouth, "'then paused with hand in midair. "'Hullo! What's the matter at the Chateau d'If?' said the captain. "'A small white cloud, which had attracted Dante's attention, "'crowned the summit of the bastion of Chateau d'If. "'At the same moment the faint report of the gun was heard. "'The sailors looked at one another. "'What is this?' asked the captain. "'A prisoner has escaped from the Chateau d'If, "'and they are firing the alarm gun,' replied Dantes. "'The captain glanced at him, "'but he had lifted the rum to his lips and was drinking it, "'with so much composure that suspicions, if the captain had any, "'died away. "'At any rate,' murmured he, "'if it be, so much the better, "'for I have made a rare acquisition.' Under the pretense of being fatigued, Dantes asked to take the helm. The steersman, glad to be relieved, looked at the captain, and the latter by a sign indicated that he might abandon it to his new comrade. Dantes could thus keep his eyes on Marseilles. "'What is the day of the month?' asked he of Jacopo, who sat down beside him. "'The 28th of February. In what year?' "'In what year? You ask me in what year?' "'Yes,' replied the young man. "'I ask you in what year?' "'You have forgotten, then?' "'I got such a fright last night,' replied Dante, smiling, "'that I've almost lost my memory. "'I ask you, what year is it?' "'The year 1829,' returned Jacobo. "'It was fourteen years, day for day, since Dante's arrest. "'He was nineteen when he entered the Chateau d'If. "'He was thirty-three when he escaped. "'A sorrowful smile passed over his face. "'He asked himself what had become of Mercedes, "'who must believe him dead.' Then his eyes lighted up with hatred as he thought of the three men who had caused him so long and wretched a captivity. He renewed against Danglars, Fernand, and Villefort the oath of implacable vengeance he had made in his dungeon. This oath was no longer a vain menace, for the fastest sailor in the Mediterranean would have been unable to overtake the little tartan that with every stitch of canvas set was flying before the wind to Leghorn. End of chapter 21 Recording by Von Ullman Vaughnsbooks.com Chapter Twenty Two of the Count of Monte Cristo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Von Ullman. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumont. Chapter Twenty Two The Smugglers. Dantes had not been a day on board before he had a very clear idea of the men with whom his lot had been cast. Without having been in the school of the Abbe Faria, the master of the young Amelia, the name of the Genoese tartan, knew a smattering of all the tongues spoken on the shores of that large lake called the Mediterranean, from the Arabic to the Provençal, and this, while it spared him interpreters, persons always troublesome and frequently indiscreet, gave him great facilities of communication, either with the vessels he met at sea, with the small boats sailing along the coast, or with the people without name, country, or occupation, who are always seen on the quays or seaports and who lived by hidden and mysterious means which we must suppose to be a direct gift of providence, as they had no visible means of support. It is fair to assume that Dantes was on board a smuggler. At first the captain had received Dantes on board with a certain degree of distrust. He was very well known to the customs officers of the coast, and as there was between these worthies and himself a perpetual battle of wits, he had at first thought that Dantes might be an emissary of these industrious guardians of rights and duties, who perhaps employed this ingenious means of learning some of the secrets of his trade. But the skillful manner in which Dantes had handled the lugger had entirely reassured him, and then, when he saw the light plume of smoke floating above the bastion of the Chateau d'If, and heard the distant report, he was instantly struck with the idea that he had on board his vessel one whose coming and going, like that of kings, was accompanied with salutes of artillery. This made him less uneasy it must be owned, than if the newcomer had proved to be a customs officer. But this supposition also disappeared like the first, when he beheld the perfect tranquillity of his recruit. Edmund thus had the advantage of knowing what the owner was, without the owner knowing who he was. And, however the old sailor and his crew tried to pump him, they extracted nothing more from him. He gave accurate descriptions of Naples and Malta, which he knew as well as Marseilles, and held stoutly to his first story. Thus the Genoese, subtle as he was, was duped by Edmund in whose favor his mild demeanor, his nautical skill, and his admirable dissimulation pleaded. 
Moreover, it is possible that the Genoese is one of those shrewd persons who know nothing but what they should know, and believe nothing but what they should believe. In this state of mutual understanding they reached Leghorn. Here Edmund was to undergo another trial. He was to find out whether he could recognize himself, as he had not seen his own face for fourteen years. He had preserved a tolerably good remembrance of what the youth had been, and was now to find out what the man had become. His comrades believed that his vow was fulfilled. As he had twenty times touched at Leghorn, he remembered a barber at St. Fernand Street. He went there to have his beard and hair cut. The barber gazed in amazement at this man with the long, thick, and black hair and beard, which gave his head the appearance of one of Titian's portraits. At this period it was not the fashion to wear so large a beard and hair so long. Now a barber would only be surprised if a man gifted with such advantages should consent voluntarily to deprive himself of them. The leghorn barber said nothing, and went to work. When the operation was concluded, and Edmund felt that his chin was completely smooth, and his hair reduced to its usual length, he asked for a hand-glass. He was now, as we have said, three and thirty years of age, and his fourteen years' imprisonment had produced a great transformation in his appearance. Dantes had entered the Chateau d'If with the round, open, smiling face of a young and happy man, with whom the early past of life had been smooth, and who anticipates a future corresponding with his past. This was now all changed. The oval face was lengthened, his smiling mouth had assumed the firm and marked lines which betoken resolution, his eyebrows were arched beneath a brow furrowed with thought, his eyes were full of melancholy, and from their depths occasionally sparked gloomy fires of misanthropy and hatred. His complexion, so long kept from the sun, had now that pale color which produces, when the features are encircled with black hair, the aristocratic beauty of the man of the north. The profound learning he had acquired had besides diffused over his features a refined intellectual expression. And he had also acquired, being naturally of a goodly stature, that vigor which a frame possesses, which has so long concentrated all its force within itself. To the elegance of a nervous and slight form had succeeded the solidity of a rounded and muscular figure. As to his voice, prayers, sobs, and imprecations had changed it, so that at times it was of a singularly penetrating sweetness, at others rough and almost hoarse. Moreover, from being so long in twilight or darkness, his eyes had acquired the faculty of distinguishing objects in the night, common to the hyena and the wolf. Edmund smiled when he beheld himself. It was impossible that his best friend, if indeed he had any friend left, could recognize him. He could not recognize himself. The master of the young Amelia, who was very desirous of retaining among his crew a man of Edmund's value, had offered to advance him funds out of his future profits, which Edmund had accepted. His next care on leaving the barbers, who had achieved his first metamorphosis, was to enter a shop and buy a complete sailor's suit, a garb, as we all know, very simple and consisting of white trousers, a striped shirt, and a cap. It was in this costume, bringing back to Jacopo the shirt and trousers he had lent him, that Edmund reappeared before the captain of the lugger, who had made him tell his story over and over again before he could believe it, or recognize in the neat and trim sailor the man with thick and matted beard, hair tangled with seaweed, and body soaked in sea brine, whom he had picked up naked and nearly drowned. Attracted by his prepossessing appearance, he renewed his offers of an engagement to Dante's, but Dante's, who had his own projects, would not agree for a longer time than three months. The young Amelia had a very active crew, very obedient to their captain, who lost as little time as possible. He had scarcely been a week at Leghorn before the hold of his vessel was filled with printed muslins, contraband cottons, English powder, and tobacco on which the excise had forgotten to put its mark. The master was to get all this out of Leghorn free of duties, and landed on the shores of Corsica, where certain speculators undertook to forward the cargo to France they sailed. Edmund was again cleaving the azure sea, which had been the first horizon of his youth, and which he had so often dreamed of in prison. He left Gorgone on his right, and La Pionosa on his left, and went toward the country of Paoli and Napoleon. The next morning, going on deck, as he always did at an early hour, the patron found Dante's leaning against the bulwarks, gazing with intense earnestness at a pile of granite rocks, which the rising sun tinged with rosy light. It was the island of Monte Cristo. The young Amelia left it three-quarters of a league to the larboard, and kept on for Corsica. Dante's thought, as they passed so closely to the island whose name was so interesting to him, that he had only to leap into the sea and in half an hour be at the promised land. But then what could he do without instruments to discover his treasure, without arms to defend himself? Besides, what would the sailors say? What would the patron think? He must wait. Fortunately, Dante's had learned how to wait. He had waited fourteen years for his liberty, and now he was free he could wait at least six months or a year for his wealth. 
Would he not have accepted liberty without riches if it had been offered to him? Besides, were not those riches chimera, offspring of the brain of poor Abbe Faria? Had they not died with him? It is true, the letter of the Cardinal Spada was singularly circumstantial, and Dantes repeated it to himself from one end to the other, for he had not forgotten a word. Evening came, and Edmund saw the island tinged with the shades of twilight, and then disappear in the darkness from all eyes but his own. For he, with vision accustomed to the gloom of a prison, continued to behold it last of all, for he remained alone upon deck. The next morn broke off the coast of Aleria. All day they coasted, and in the evening saw fires lighted on land. The position of these was no doubt a signal for landing, for a ship's lantern was hung up on the masthead instead of the streamer, and they came to within a gunshot of the shore. Dantes noticed that the captain of the young Amelia had, as he neared the land, mounted two small culverins, which, without making much noise, can throw a four-ounce ball a thousand paces or so. But on this occasion the precaution was superfluous, and everything proceeded with the utmost smoothness and politeness. Four shallops came off with very little noise alongside the lugger, which, no doubt, in acknowledgment of the compliment, lowered her own shallop into the sea, and the five boats worked so well that by two o'clock in the morning all the cargo was out of the young Amelia and on terra firma. The same night, such a man of regularity was the patron of the young Amelia, the profits were divided, and each man had a hundred Tuscan livres, or about eighty francs. But the voyage was not ended. They turned the bowsprit toward Sardinia, where they intended to take in a cargo, which was to replace what had been discharged. The second operation was as successful as the first. The young Amelia was in luck. This new cargo was destined for the coast of the Duchy of Lucca, and consisted almost entirely of Havana cigars, sherry, and Malaga wines. There they had a bit of a skirmish in getting rid of the duties. The excise was, in truth, the everlasting enemy of the patron of the young Amelia. A customs officer was laid low, and two sailors wounded. Dantes was one of the latter, a ball having touched him on the left shoulder. Dantes was almost glad of the affray, and almost pleased at being wounded, for they were rude lessons which taught him with what eye he could view danger, and with what endurance he could bear suffering. He had contemplated danger with a smile, and when wounded had exclaimed with the great philosopher, Pain, thou art not an evil. He had, moreover, looked upon the customs officer wounded to death, and, whether from heat of blood produced by the encounter, or the chill of human sentiment, this sight had made but slight impression upon him. Dante's was on the way he desired to follow, and was moving towards the end he wished to achieve. His heart was in a fair way of petrifying in his bosom. Jacobo, seeing him fall, had believed him killed, and rushing toward him, raised him up, and then attended to him with all the kindness of a devoted comrade. This world was not then so good as Dr. Pangloss believed it, neither was it so wicked as Dante's thought it, since this man, who had nothing to expect from his comrade but the inheritance of his share of the prize money, manifested so much sorrow when he saw him fall. Fortunately, as we have said, Edmund was only wounded, and with certain herbs gathered at certain seasons, and sold to the smugglers by the old Sardinian woman, the wound soon closed. Edmund then resolved to try Jacopo, and offered him in return for his attention a share of the prize money, but Jacopo refused it indignantly. As a result of the sympathetic devotion which Jacopo had from the first bestowed on Edmund, the latter was moved to a certain degree of affection. But this sufficed for Jacopo, who instinctively felt that Edmund had a right to superiority position, a superiority which Edmund had concealed from all others and from this time the kindness which Edmund showed him was enough for the brave seaman. Then, in the long days on board ship, when the vessel gliding on with security over the azure sea required no care but the hand of the helmsman, thanks to the favorable winds that swelled her sails, Edmund, with a chart in his hand, became the instructor of Jacobo, as the poor Abbe Faria had been his tutor. He pointed out to him the bearings of the coast, and explained to him the variations of the compass, and taught him to read in that vast book opened over our heads which they call heaven and where God writes in his earth with letters of diamonds. And when Jacobo inquired of him, what is the use of teaching all these things to a poor sailor like me, Edmund replied, who knows, you may one day be the captain of a vessel. Your fellow countryman Bonaparte became emperor. We had forgotten to say that Jacobo was a Corsican. Two months and a half elapsed in these trips, and Edmund had become as skillful a coaster as he had been a hardy seaman. He had formed an acquaintance with all the smugglers on the coast, and learned all the Masonic signs by which these half-pirates recognize each other. He had passed and repassed his island of Monte Cristo twenty times, but not once had he found an opportunity of landing there. He then formed a resolution. As soon as his engagement with the patron of the young Amelia ended, he would hire a small vessel on his own account. 
for in his several voyages he had massed a hundred pisatres, and under some pretext land on the island of Monte Cristo. Then he would be free to make his researches, not perhaps entirely at liberty, for he would be doubtless watched by those who accompanied him, but in this world we must risk something. Prison had made Edmund prudent, and he was desirous of running no risk whatever, but in vain did he rack his imagination, fertile as it was, he could not devise any plan for reaching the island without companionship. Dantes was tossed about on these doubts and wishes, when the patron, who had great confidence in him and was very desirous of retaining him in his service, took him by the arm one evening and led him to a tavern on the Via de Loglio, where the leading smugglers of Leghorn used to congregate and discuss affairs connected with their trade. Already Dantes had visited this maritime bourse two or three times, and seeing all these hardy free traders, who supplied the whole coast for nearly two hundred leagues in extent, he had asked himself what power might not that man attain who should give the impulse of his will to all these contrary and diverging minds. This time it was a great matter that was under discussion, connected with a vessel laden with turkey carpets, stuffs of the Levant, and cashmeres. It was necessary to find some neutral ground on which an exchange could be made, and then to try to land these goods on the coast of France. If the venture was successful, the profit would be enormous. There would be a gain of fifty or sixty piastres for each of the crew. The patron of the young Amelia proposed, as a place of landing, the island of Monte Cristo, which, being completely deserted, and having neither soldiers nor revenue officers, seemed to have been placed in the midst of the ocean since the time of the heathen Olympus by Mercury, the god of merchants and robbers, classes of mankind which we in modern times have separated, if not made distinct, but which antiquity appeared to have included in the same category. At the mention of Monte Cristo, Dante started with joy. He rose to conceal his emotion and took a turn around the smoky tavern where all the languages of the known world were jumbled in a lingua franca. When he again joined the two persons who had been discussing the matter, it had been decided that they should touch at Monte Cristo, and set out on the following night. Edmund, being consulted, was of opinion that the island afforded every possible security, and that great enterprises, to be well done, should be done quickly. Nothing then was altered in the plan, and orders were given to get under way next night, and, wind and weather permitting, to make the neutral island by the following day. End of chapter 22. Recording by Von Ullman, Vaughn's Books.com.